Його Всеканадського комітету з питань обізнаності про Голодомор вітаю на представленню мережі нащадків Голодомору в Канаді. Наша програма проходитиме в англійській мові. Надіюсь, що це не спричини жодних труднощів. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Canadian launch of the Global Holodomor Descendants Network, an initiative of the Ukrainian World Congress International Holodomor Coordinating Committee. The Global Network was announced by the Ukrainian World Congress in November 2020. My name is Irina Mitsak, and I'm chair of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress National Holodomor Awareness Committee as well as a member of the Ukrainian World Congress International Holodomor Coordinating Committee. I always speak with pride about our joint efforts internationally, and particularly here in Canada, to educate and raise awareness of the Holodomor in Ukraine. We have gained recognition of the Holodomor and related historical events as a genocide and we continue to ensure the exposure of our students to the subject matter in Canadian public and Catholic schools. We foster research, produce award-winning films, nurture artistic endeavors, create publications and exhibits. The list goes on. But our most important work is that which we have done with our survivors of the Holodomor documenting the stories which they have so courageously shared with us. They understood the need for us to hear their stories in the hope that their experiences would contribute to greater awareness, understanding, and to preventing similar atrocities from happening in the future. And we know that they do continue to this day. Sadly, with the passage of time, Many, if not most of our survivors have left this world. And it is our hope that the family members, descendants of the survivors of the Holodomor will join the effort to ensure that the victims of this genocide are remembered eternally and that their truth lives on to educate for a better, kinder world. You may be wondering who is the we to who I keep referring. Credit for Canadian achievements belongs first and foremost to the broader Ukrainian community in Canada. Organizations and individuals that continue to work tirelessly on this issue as led by the National Holodomor Awareness and Education Committees of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. But we are also very fortunate to have several effective active institutions in Canada with a focus on the Holodomor. These include the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta, the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center, and the Holodomor National Awareness Tour. Together, and now to be joined by the unique voice of the Holodomor Descendants Network, we form a very powerful group of stakeholders positioned to move Holodomor awareness and education to the next level. With our one hour program today, we will explore the importance of the Descendants Network with a brief discussion, followed by information on the network itself and how to get involved. Allow me to introduce our panelists this evening. Mila Panaskevich is a singer, songwriter, composer, and vocal coach, coach educated at UCLA in the US and now living in Winnipeg, Manitoba. A granddaughter of Holodomor survivor, Mila was inspired to share her grandmother's stories using her creative talents. She has written poetry that has been recited in the Senate of Canada, composed a song and co-written a book. She actively participates in local Holodomor commemorations and advocates for Holodomor awareness. Dr. Peter Kondra is a doctor of medicine practicing as a child and adolescent psychiatrist. He was appointed assistant clinical professor, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences, Faculty of Health Sciences at McMaster University. Dr. Kondra is co-developer of child and youth mental health toolkits used to provide training in child psychiatry. Active in the Ukrainian community in Canada, 
he was appointed as official representative of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada to the Canadian Council of Churches. Dr. Clint Curl is Vice President of Research and Exhibitions at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Dr. Curl began his career in the legal profession and before joining the museum in 2010, he was a university professor, executive director of a human rights NGO and a parish pastor. His education includes a PhD in political science, master's degrees in law and theology and a law degree. I should add that the next time you do have an opportunity to be in Winnipeg, please visit the CMHR, which prominently features the story of the Holodomor and its human rights journey. Olya Soroka is an active member of the Ukrainian community in the United States, currently living in Chicago. Olya's maternal grandparents, mother, aunt, and uncle, and extended family experienced the Holodomor in the Zhitomir Oblast of Ukraine. She has taken on the role of chair of the Ukrainian World Congress Global Holodomor Descendants Network to ensure awareness, understanding, and memorialization by future generations. Our discussion this evening will be moderated by Marta Bazuk, Executive Director of the Toronto-based Holodomor Research and Education Consortium, or HREC as we know it. Marta works to promote awareness and understanding of the Holodomor through a range of research, education, and outreach activities, engaging academic audiences and the broader public. Marta has a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University and over 25 years experience in international development and the not-for-profit sector. But before I turn our discussion over to Marta, we begin with a short video. Excerpts of testimonies given by children of Holodomor survivors as documented by the project titled Children of Holodomor Survivors Speak. This groundbreaking oral history project of the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center consists of interviews with children of Holodomor survivors and is the first such project to address its impact on the lives of the second generation of survivors in the diaspora. We welcome UCRDC as a partner of the Holodomor Descendants Network in Canada and look forward to the natural synergy between the two projects. And I will just take a moment to share my screen. Ladies and gentlemen, our presentation on Holodomor descendants. A unique voice. If anybody were to ask me to describe my mother with one word, it would be a survivor. It's all she knew how to do. In fact, dying was not easy. Uh, my mom uh, passed away at home, uh, in, in her own home uh, at the age of 90, with, of course, my help and, and the system I helped to create. They were there for her palliative care at home. No hospital for her, absolutely. And uh, two days before she passed, one of her personal support workers who came to love her very much started to cry and she says, why are you crying? Why are you crying? She says, oh, she says, I don't want you to die. She says, I'm not dying. <laughs> right up till the end, not something we talked about. Um, that it was ingrained, it was ingrained. And, and uh, the whole of the mar uh, was responsible. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um I think the first time she mentioned it uh, was when I was seven. So this would be 1956. Uh, I had been an aspiring artist. I, on the, I remember to this day on this windowsill, I had carved a car, an image of a car. And my mother freaked out. 
um, because you know went through the lacquer and all this and that's the first time i heard about hold them you know it had nothing to do but i think it was like a breaking point for her and everything just came out you know the, she starts talking about this how you know uh, how ungrateful I was, you know, here I have everything, but she was deprived of this and that, and, that. and it's, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I said, wow, where's this coming from? And uh, so that was, the, you know, it's still in my memory that the first incident, uh, I still see the window, I still see the, the car, and I remember that meltdown she had uh, that triggered it. Well, I, 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 I wonder if I would have I chosen uh, criminal law and and sort of social justice and have an interest in human rights had my parents not had this uh, experience, had, had my parents not persevered during this horrible time. I, I mean, that, that's why I, I hear about uh, what, what happened in... Um, in Rwanda, for for uh, e e example, or Bosnia Herzegovina, and and I'm horrified by 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 that. So uh, I think it had developed, you know, my 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 sense of social justice, my my interests in in my career, and I, I suppose even the types of friendships that I've 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 chosen, type of interests I I pursue. But you see. You take a look at these two people here. Here they are. And they survived the whole of the mod. And here is the result, partial result of that. So when you snuff out that life, you see how much of life you snuff out. So in a sense, it's a way of reminding us of that. And now we begin the uh, panel discussion part of the evening. I'd like to thank Irka Mitsak for, and the other organizers from UCC and the World Congress for inviting me to participate tonight. It's both a pleasure and an honor for me to be a part of this launch. We have a wonderful and diverse panel with us tonight. And uh, once we've had a chance to hear from all four, then we will open the floor to questions. You'll see the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can send your questions using that. I'd like to start our discussion with a question to Mila. Mila, could you tell us, do you remember when you first learned of the Holodomor and how did you learn that this was part of your own family history? Thank you, Marta. First, um, before answering, I would like to say thank you to the UCC for having me. Um, it is an honor and privilege to be part of this launch today. So when I think of Baba, uh, my grandmother, Hanna Panasuk, who was a Holodomor survivor, um, well, first I'll say she was from a village called Hurbinsi. This was in the Poltava region, and she was only 11 years old when uh, Holodomor first began. Um, and when she immigrated uh, with my grandfather, my aunt and uncle and cousins, we, this was in the early 2000s and neither her children nor her grandchildren, me included, knew um, that she went through such a time. So I, I would say it was only unt around 2007 that Baba slowly began starting to share her story and the horrific experiences that she faced. And you were about how old at that point when you first learned? At that point, I was, yes, I was 17 years old at that time. And so at that point, you're an aspiring singer, um, and now you're a composer and a songwriter. How, if it has, how has being a descendant of a whole of the more survivor had an impact on you as an artist and on your artistic expression? I mean, not long after I first learned of Baba's horrific past and understood that she carried this, carried, pardon me, this burden for the majority of her life, um, as an artist and as a descendant, I felt a need to share. 
um, not only because it evoked feelings and emotions in me, but just in order to bring the truth of her past uh, to light through artistic expression. Mm -hmm. uh, I, can, I can say at that time, um, you know, a year after learning of her stories and other survivor stories through the Ukrainian community, through, through our church, um, St. Mary the Protectress Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Winnipeg, um, you know, it was, it, again, it evoked so many emotions that I felt the easiest way for me at that time was to write a poem. And that's a poem I wrote that's called Unspoken Truth. And I remember purposely wanting to be blunt and clear in my language to deliver a strong message to hopefully reach many different demographics and evoke emotions and feelings in others and really encourage others to want to listen and understand uh, what a tragic time in history it was for Ukrainian people. Thank you, Mila. We'll go through all of our panelists and uh, I'm hoping that there'll be follow-up in the form of questions to our panelists. I'd like to turn now to Dr. Peter Kondra. Uh, Dr. Kondra, you're a psychiatrist and you have expertise in dealing with children and adolescents. Could you talk about some of the issues that arise in families with histories of trauma, such as the Holodomor? Thank you for this invitation. It's a privilege to participate in this event. Never did I imagine that my background in genetics and psychiatry would be so relevant to our Holdemor. And the following information is what we have documented in scientific studies in families of genocide and Holodomor survivors. Intergenerational trauma has been studied in relation to many genocides, including those in Armenia, Rwanda, Cambodia, as well as the Holodomor and the Holocaust. The effects of these traumatizing events have been studied and documented to the third generation, and the fourth generation is currently being studied. What is noted in these offspring compared to the normal population, it's been found that descendants of genocides have increased rates of serious mental health conditions, such as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, mood disorders, especially depression. Interestingly, there is a gender difference with the transmission of PTSD. Mothers' offspring have higher rates of PTSD than do fathers. Regarding mood disorders and anxiety, if either parent has these, then they are transmitted equally and at a higher rate than you would expect in the normal population. Examples of intergenerational trauma effects can also include changes how people think and feel, such as exhibiting intense, excessive feelings of guilt and blame, often called survivor guilt. Other intergenerational effects include morbid grief that endures well beyond decades, intrusive imagery, problems separating and individuating from, your, from parents, that may create dysfunctional relationships. It is indeed remarkable that so much evidence exists to document the intergenerational effects of trauma, which has been experienced by individuals affected by the Holodomor. Well, um, perhaps a natural follow-up to that question, given the purpose of tonight's event. Do you see there being a role for a network like this in healing families? Yes, I do. Um, very important. And again, I turn to scientific uh, evidence that documents the benefits of these things, uh, of these types of uh, settings. Um, individuals benefit by sharing their stories. They often can become aware of what may be impacting their families and hopefully seeking help. Often survivors don't make the connections that they are, that what they are living as a, is as being a consequence of the Holodomor. Descendants groups will provide a safe place to share and consider these responsibilities. There are excellent treatments available for trauma victims or survivors that are applicable to offspring, which can free them and their offspring from this tragic burden of trauma. Most 
researchers are studying these individuals are struck by the resilience and strength of some of the survivors. Frequently, researchers comment in their presentations about the inner strength and sense of determination to community, some members of this panel, about friends and family who exhibit these traits, traits of inner strength and perseverance. We are not simply victims of the past. We can adapt, we can learn. By sharing experiences and knowing how we can be affected by trauma for many generations, individuals can learn how to adapt to our current reality. Resilient survivors and their offspring can be a tremendous source of inspiration and healing. This is perhaps one of the most compelling reasons for establishing this network, not only for this generation, but for future generations to understand intergenerational trauma. Inspiring resilient survivors who model perseverance and coping with, with whatever difficulties we may encounter can teach us much needed life skills, especially relevant to the COVID pandemic in which we find ourselves today. Thank you. I'd like now to turn to Clint Curl. Dr. Curl, you bring to your position at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, both a legal background and a background in theology. And with that perspective, I'm wondering what role you see the Descendants Network as having in the promotion of human rights and justice. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marta, for the for the question. And uh, I'd like to also thank the Ukrainian Canadian Congress for inviting me uh, to join this really important uh, event. So maybe I'll just begin uh, talking just what are human rights? So human rights are the, the basic rights and freedoms that belong to every person in the world. They're based on shared values like dignity and fairness and equality and respect and freedom. And human rights nowadays are carried by laws, but they're really best taught not through laws so much as, as through stories, through real life stories that illustrate why human rights are important, how hard they are to get, how easy they are to lose, and the incredible human harm that results when human rights are lost. And when I think about the Holodomor, uh, uh, and, and the crucial role that the survivors played in bringing those stories forward, uh, uh, and, and just seeing really in the last five or 10 years, uh, uh, the, 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 the narratives and the memories of the Holodomor just beginning to take their proper place within human rights education. And, and now I'm seeing, you know, the Holodomor Descendants Network having such a big role to play in continuing that trend that's just beginning. I, I would almost call it um, mainstreaming the Holodomor in human rights research. Uh, and uh, because really the descendants have become, in a sense, the, the story keepers right, for the whole de uh, There are so many human rights lessons that we can learn from the whole de uh, If I could just give three examples out of many, I mean, the first one maybe is most obvious um, from the point of view of those uh, uh, working to promote human rights. We are all very keenly interested in, in preventing genocide. And the thing about genocides is they keep happening all around the world. And so like a disease, the better we can understand how those gross violations happen, the better we can be at preventing them and making interventions once they begin. So understanding the mechanisms of uh, uh, genocides like the Holodomor, it's of great interest for those who would like to prevent genocides today. Uh, the second important uh, uh, thing I would like to talk about uh, when it comes to connecting Holodomor and human rights and human rights education is the right to food. So let me read to you uh, the following from a United Nations statement. Uh, and as I do read this, uh, I would like uh, all of the audience just to bring to mind the Holodomor. The right to adequate food is a human right inherent in all people to have regular, permanent, and unrestricted access to adequate and sufficient food corresponding to the cultural traditions of the people and which ensures a physical and mental dignified life free of fear." End quote. 
Now, can you think of a better illustration to understand the importance and seriousness of the, that human right, the right to food, than the Holodomor? I can't. I, I think it's, it's really, really important uh, that we think about having food, adequate food, as essential to the full expression of our human dignity. And the Holodomor, like nothing else, helps us understand the link between food, human dignity, and human rights. And the last, I'm almost done, the third human rights connection is the right to know the truth. Uh, one of the reasons the Holodomor is so important for everyone to know is because it shows the dehumanizing effect of denial, the shroud of secrecy that was imposed over the Holodomor for so many decades is, is I think, unparalleled. Uh, and, and people's right to know the truth, it's emerging today as an important universal human right. So under legal instruments, such as the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances, other similar legal instruments, people have now a right to know what happened. Governments have a duty to reveal the truth. And so the connections to the right to the truth and the Holodomor, I think is very clear. It's a human right to know what happened. Governments have a duty to tell the truth and secrecy and cover up in this context is destructive. It's itself a human rights violation. And those are just a few ways in which the Holodomor is relevant to human rights and why the Holodomor is at the same time a Ukrainian tragedy and a tragedy that speaks to everyone in the world, quite literally a genocide and a crime against humanity. Think about those words, crime against humanity. The whole world uh, really forgets the Holodomor at its peril. And so the whole world needs organizations like the Holodomor Descendants Network to continue to bring forward the memories, the narratives, the stories that help us better understand what human rights are about. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm moved and inspired by what you've said. Uh, and as I consider it, I see a role of this network in upholding the memory of the victims of the Holodomor and giving it meaning beyond that they, they didn't die in vain, that through this network and through the educational work that can be done, um, their, their lives can have meaning in really a broad global sense for working to prevent further atrocities. Thank you for that. I'd like now to turn to our final speaker on the panel, Olya Soroka. Uh, Olya, first I'd like to congratulate you as the first chair of the Global Holodomor Descendants Network. And I'm wondering what made you take on this challenge? What's, what is your vision for the network that motivated you to take a leadership role in this endeavor? Thank you, Marta. And thank you to the Ukrainian uh, Canadian Congress for inviting me to this event. I'm honored to be part of this esteemed panel tonight. Um, what prompted me to accept the invitation to be the chair was to honor my family. Um, my family comes from a history of struggle in Ukraine. On my mother's side through the whole of the Mara, on my father's side uh, being in, in the military fighting against both the Nazis and the communist invaders of Ukraine. So basically that uh, plus the way that I've been raised by them uh, in a Christian patriotic environment is what really prompted me and gives me the passion to want to do the best I possibly can for this Descendants Network. With respect to the vision for um, the whole Demod Descendants Network, it really is to be the unique and perpetual voice for our families who were victims of the whole Demod genocide. It's amazing that despite a preponderance of facts proving that Stalin's regime ordered the Holodomor as a way to subjugate the will of the Ukrainian nation, end Ukraine's fight for independence, wipe out the millennia of history, culture, religion, and language. Russia and its allies still deny the Holodomor for what it really was. And by the way, Stalin failed because we are not a nation that gives up. We believe that by unifying the descendants of the Holodomor survivors, we'll have that unique and large group that will be the perpetual voice for our families who suffered and are no longer able to speak for themselves. 
The network will continue sharing the accounts relayed by our families of the suffering they endured by the Stalin and post famine of 1932-33, which quite honestly occurred during a period of abundant harvest in Ukraine. It was unfathomable, the lies that have been spread about this. In this way, the Holodomor Descendants Network will contribute by dispelling the disinformation Holodomor deniers keep spreading about the Holodomor. The Descendants Network will also work to identify the survivors in order to memorialize them as victims of an evil regime in a similar manner to the work currently being done to identify and memorialize the victims who died during the Holodomor. Who better than the descendants to do this important work? We believe that the work of the Holdmaw Descendants Network will stem from a deeply personal desire to ensure that the suffering of our families was not in vain and that the world is aware of how evil governments use genocides to wipe out nations and steal their heritage for themselves. As we heard just a, a few minutes ago from Dr. Kondra, we also know that the effects of the Holdemar are not limited to those who just suffered during the genocide. Research indicates that these follow-on effects are exhibited in future generations. We will work to raise the awareness and understanding among the descendants of this research and how it may be impacting their behavior and health while potentially becoming participants in that research ourselves. I, for one, was not aware of the effects potentially on myself or on my children and grandchildren. I believe I recognized some effects in the behaviors of my family, but really did not think that it passed on to generations. So when I heard about the research, I felt it was an important aspect of the whole Demod Descendants Network to include in our work. The Holdemar Descendants Network is a natural evolution of the work of many Ukrainian awareness and educational organizations in the diaspora and in Ukraine. They've worked for decades on the recognition by all countries of the world that the Holodomor was a genocide against the Ukrainian nation. We join them and believe our unique voice as descendants will contribute to that overarching objective for all Ukrainians, wherever we may be in the world. Well, thank you, Olya. I, I would just add, in my work at the Holodomor Research Education Consortium, we give research grants every year, and typically what we're uh, most used to is proposals in the, in the area of history. But one year we got one from an epidemiologist studying incidence of diabetes in subsequent generations, and it turns out that diabetes is uh, in, in this, this research was done in Ukraine, that uh, diabetes uh, is significantly more prevalent in, in the descendants of Holodomor survivors. So that's just one area that might be of interest to this network to explore further actual physical impact of, uh, on, on families of, of starvation. Um, well, I was also thinking it would be interesting for the people listening to hear a little bit more about how you see the network working globally to realize its goals. Yes, thank you, Marta. Um, we are a global organization, and given that uh, acronym, we, we have adopted an operating model where our vision, mission, objectives, and core values are set at the global level. However, uh, to complete our actions and accomplish our specific goals, we, we will create and uh, execute that locally through networks. For example, in countries where we have large populations of Ukrainians, we will create national Holodomor descendants networks. While in countries where there are Ukrainian population might be a bit smaller or a little uh, less active um, because there are recent immigrants into those countries, will work to create regional networks. These national and regional networks will be able to identify appropriate actions to take for the specific local culture, environment, and population, however, always aligning to the global objectives of our network. The whole Demotic Descendants Network launched today in Canada is a great example of this approach. Similarly, a whole Demotic Descendants Network was launched in the United States in November of 2020 under the auspices of the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America's 
U.S. Committee for Holodomor Genocide Awareness. Initial work done by the U.S. network with assistance from the Canadian team members was leveraged and evolved into the Global Holodomor Descendants Network under the auspices of the Ukrainian World Congress on the initiative of its International Coordinating Committee for Holodomor Awareness and Recognition, which we launched in November 2020. One of our initial actions is to identify and unify descendants to join the network. I'm pleased to inform you uh, that descendants may now join the global network as of today via the link that Irka will be talking about in a few minutes. And uh, I really invite all descendants of Holodomor victims to join us in order to memor memorialize your families, share their accounts of the Holodomor and learn about long lasting effects that may be affecting us. Thank you. Uh, Marta, I think you're muted. I am so sorry. Uh, thank you, Olya, and thank you to the panelists for their contributions to this discussion. Uh, I'd like to check in with Eric Mitsak. Do we have time for questions, or and did you want to address some of these that have popped up in the Q&A? Irka, you're also muted, by the way. So. Of course I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I think there's there's one question here we can direct to Olya. Um, would the individuals who are registered on the whole of the Modi Descendants Network be amenable to participate in doctoral research studies? We would be asking people if they would be interested in participating, and we would ask the sponsors of that research if they would uh, want to have volunteers participate in the research to help further any of that research. We'd want to do it in an environment that is um, safe, that would protect the privacy of their personal information, and uh, we would be working through those details as we work through um, the potential to participate, yes. Um, there's a question, um, several, several for Dr. Kondra, um, but I'll uh, pose these. What, what precautions must be taken to minimize risk of stress anxiety to ensure um, IRB approval with what may be considered a vulnerable population? Um, yeah, they certainly would be considered a vulnerable population and you'd have to make accommodations um, for their um, health status and uh, ability in, to participate in any kind of prolonged interviews um, and you would definitely have to seek uh, IRB approval for for that type of research. And is there any evidence that the trauma of events like the whole of the Moor have a genetic effect that can be passed down through survivors? Ah, uh, the question of epigenetics. Um, so thanks, Yars, for the question. Good question. Uh, epigenetics uh, is certainly at play, um, whether you go through a whole of the Moor or life uh, in general. Uh, it's, it's all around us and it's happening to us every day. Uh, certainly, um, the significant trauma, trauma events of the whole of the mod, um, will have a, sig a very significant impact. And as we've heard in terms of diabetes and um, mental health conditions, um, there, there is an effect generational for multi-generations, at least three and may probably four. So um, it's, it's not that the DNA itself is, uh, un, is uh, modified, but uh, epigenetics is where triggers or stimuli in your environment um, affect uh, how genes are expressed. They're sort of like, a, the, it's the modulation of the genes. And then that in itself becomes passed on. So, um, and they're sort of, upmodulated or upregulated uh, so that that certainly does happen but the genes not necessarily are actually altered
Thank you. And I will, um, as we're um, at quarter to the hour, I will um, pose one more question. This is to Olya Soroka. Um, how difficult or easy was it to start the network in the United States? And what challenges can we expect here in Canada with the start of our network? As with any Ukrainian uh, organizations, they're basically based on uh, volunteers. And uh, what we find is that uh, there are a lot of uh, people who volunteer for many organizations and you see a lot of people in the same organizations. There also are a lot of people that will participate in events, they'll participate in conferences or commemorations, but they just don't have the capacity or uh, desire to be active in the formation or the, the uh, setup of a huge effort like what we're doing today. So um, that is something that we are still working on in the United States, you know, getting people to be part of that core that actually is hands-on and doing the hard work of setting up a network, uh, pulling it in, in, into existence. However, we've got a number of dedicated people. And once we have um, our plans, which we are in the process of finalizing, um, we have a net, whole network using the U.S. Committee for Holodomor Genocide Awareness uh, that has done a phenomenal job in, get, in getting the states and uh, the United States to include Holodomor in the curricula of um, high schools, uh, which I think is middle schools in Canada, uh, and getting legislatures uh, by the states to uh, put out proclamations recognizing the whole Demod as a genocide. So that whole network is who we will work with. And we'll also work through the many youth organizations, churches, um, you know, to overcome the challenges of not having a large group of people. We also believe that once word is out about the network and, and descendants can register, we're offering an option there for them to tell us how they want to be a participant, whether they want to be fully in and engage with us and be part of some of our committees, or whether they just want to be informed and follow and participate in our events. Okay, thank you. I think uh, with uh, time running quickly, um, there are a few other questions we received, um, but what we will do is we will answer you personally, so you receive answers to your questions. Um, and I would like to turn it back over to Marta to um, maybe wrap up this section of our evening. Thank you, Irka. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, there are a, a number of interesting questions that we may not have, get, uh, not, may not have time to get to. I do uh, encourage people to look, for example, at, at the website. This is not just um, promotion of the Holdemar Research Education Consortium, but I would like you to know there are many resources out there for people who do want to learn more about the Holodomor, and the HREC website is one. And again, I'd like to thank our panelists for their candor, for their passion for this subject, and for sharing with us tonight about a really personal topic in some cases, and sometimes just with your professional knowledge that has enriched this discussion. And now I turn the floor over to Alexander, Alexander Kichi, the national president of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Lesya. Yakuya Marta. Um, I would like to thank all of our panelists for keeping the memory alive. Uh, and in particular to Irka Mitsak, who in Canada for many decades has demonstrated leadership in building Holodomor awareness and we have been fortunate in Canada to see recognition of the whole of the Mod as a genocide by our federal parliament. Dr. Curl spoke about the importance of knowing the truth. I was privileged to be engaged by the Ukrainian World Congress to sit second chair to the late John Supinka at the International Commission of Inquiry into the Great Famine, as it was then known, in Brussels in 1988. I know that the efforts of the diaspora were key in uncovering the truth because on the eve of the opening of inquiry, the prominent Soviet journal Ogonyok published for the very first time 
an admission that something had happened in 1932 and 33. It was not a full admission, but it was also not coincidental that they chose that day to publish. That was the beginning of Glasnost and Perestroika, but our work is not yet done because to this day, Russia refuses to recognize the Holodomor as a genocide against the Ukrainian people. I know how important it is to keep the memory alive. I have stood with my friends, children of Holodomor survivors before the Holodomor Memorial in Kyiv and wept with them as they mourned and remembered. I know that they need to heal and I hope this network helps them do that. Thank you, Lesu. Um, thank you for those for those heartfelt words. Um, and and I would like to thank um, both UCC and and yourself personally for the support um, for this initiative. Um, uh, it is greatly greatly appreciated. Uh, I would also like to express a big thank you to our participants of our discussion this evening. Um, you have shed light on the many issues that will drive the Descendants Network going forward while highlighting its critical importance in continuing our awareness and education efforts across Canada and around the world. Your time and your insight have been greatly appreciated. Um, as, I, as I already said, if, there, if you still have questions along the way, you can add questions to the Q&A and we will answer them. Um, um, in writing, so you do receive your answers to your questions. Um, Ehud, if you could pull up the UCC site, the UWC site, sorry. Um, um, I'll just take a few minutes just to tell you a bit about the network itself, uh, a bit about the project itself. Uh, one second. Um, and how, more importantly, how you can help. Um, more information about the global network, its goals uh, and objectives are available by visiting the website of the Ukrainian World Congress, where you will also find the registration form to join the network. It's important to note that although we are building a global database, uh, we will be working nationally, regionally, and in our local communities on various projects and initiatives. If you are a descendant, uh, in other words, and, and we're often asked who is a descendant. A descendant is if, if a blood relative or relatives either died during or survived the Holodomor of 1932-33 in Ukraine. And you're interested in joining the network, um, please visit the UWC site. Um, Ehud, if you can pull up the slide with the contact information, please. Um, so if you visit the site, you'll be able to receive information on research activities, uh, on events, or you can share family accounts and actively support initiatives. Uh, we sincerely invite you to add your voice. Um, don't be afraid. Um, your participation in the network will be at a level that is comfortable and meaningful for you. Um, that will be your choosing. Um, next slide, Ihor. Uh, if you are not a descendant, we still need your help. Uh, in Canada, we have launched the Canadian Holodomor Descendants Outreach Initiative, which is co-chaired by three individuals, uh, descendants of Holodomor survivors um, and tireless, tireless advocates uh, for Holodomor awareness and education. Uh, that's Irena Balan from Winnipeg, Natalka Diduch from St. Catharines, and Valentina Noseworthy from Winnipeg. Irena, Natalka, and Valentina will be working with our communities to engage descendants and supporters in building our Canadian network. We do appeal to you to please help us, to help us to identify uh, and contact descendants, engage your church communities, your local organizations, share information on the channels that are available to you, 
and actively promote this initiative. We all have an important role to play and we trust that we can count on you. On this note, um, I would like to close by just um, once again, thanking our participants. Um, I thank the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. I thank uh, the Holodomor Awareness Committee, uh, which has put this event together. Um, and the Ukrainian World Congress for your uh, very uh, close cooperation um, in, in realizing this event. Um, and, and to all of you, I should inform you that we have uh, close to 100 people uh, watching this evening, um, plus a few dozen more on Facebook. Um, and that is really testimony to the importance of this event, the importance of this network. Um, and it's very um, warming to, to know that there is this support, that there will be support for this network. Uh, and we look forward to working you, with you forward uh, in the future in furthering this initiative. So once again, thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good evening and stay safe. Good night. <laughs>